Yeah, looks like I've been made a uh, co-host, so it's great to see you. Okay, great. Great, I can hear you too, good. Awesome, awesome, cool. All right, so for a quick intro, um, this is the uh, third, I believe, talk that uh, we've given this way. I think we're gonna call this the SIF Chain Vision Series, although that's not uh, yet nailed. Um, but the, the point is like, this is just a talk that we've had with a couple other great crypto economic thought leaders uh, we had one with uh, Michael Zargum from Block Science and Josh Tan from MetaGov. And uh, the, the point is just to have good conversations. Mark and I have had a lot of great offline conversations, but to bring that offline and give people a bit more of a taste for um, where this industry is going from the vantage point of people who like to be a little bit academic, a little bit philosophical, but also are building things that have high crypto economic value. So uh, Mark, I'm really happy to have you on. Yeah, same here, same here. Uh, great to be here. Cool. So um, I, I want to do a bit of an intro for you and then you can kind of fill in any gaps that I, I miss and then we'll just kind of riff from there. So uh, Mark and I have known each other for a couple of years uh, when he was working on uh, earlier versions of Agoric. Um, Agoric is a uh, new smart contracting platform um, that's built on the Cosmos SDK, uh, but it uh, uses um, object capabilities rather than access controls. Uh, and I'll... Uh, Mark, why don't you kind of explain a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, so it's actually just being very pedantic on the terminology. It's uh, using object capabilities rather than access control lists, but both um, both object capabilities and access control lists are forms of access control. Um, the, uh, the, the, the better classification of to get at the essential idea is that uh, access control lists are identity-based access control. Uh, all questions, all access questions start with who are you? And then based on the identity of the thing doing the accessing or you know, the person or thing doing the accessing, then the access is allowed or not. Uh, object capabilities are instead a form of uh, authorization-based access control where all all permission is a bearer instrument. It's, it's simply something that you have, and by virtue of having the permission, uh, you can perform the access. Uh, and the example that I really like, that we, we our community always uses to start with this, it's from Mark Stiegler, um, is uh, the car key is a bearer instrument. When I walk up to the car with my car key, uh, the car key, authorizes me to drive the car. The car recognizes the car key as my authorization. Uh, if you imagine that my car worked with an access control list, then if I wanted you to, let's say, uh, I wanted to lend you my car so that you could do me some favor, uh, I would have to tell my car, uh, Jazir is now authorized to drive you. And then while you're doing, doing me the favor, let's say, you need to go to some institution where there's a valet that would park your car. And now you give, need to give the valet, tell your car that the valet can drive it. Well, you can't because you're not the owner of the car. Uh, and the, to make the analogy with blockchain systems, uh, the fundamental access control element in Ethereum is message.sender. Uh, in Ethereum, the, the starting premise is that uh, anyone or anything can send a message to any contract. So therefore, every contract, when it receives a message, has to engage in some kind of check so it can tell whether the request, whether and how to honor the request that this message represents. So message.sender says, well, what is the, th the, 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 uh, the thing making the request? And then based on the identity of the requester, the request is allowed or not. So uh, by checking the identity of the requesting, let's say contract, it means that the contract cannot delegate its ability to make the request to some other contract because then the receiver of the request would not recognize it. Uh, and similarly, when you can't update the, um, the access control list of the car to enable the valet to park it, that's a failure to delegate. That's a failure to have authorized something that would have been allowed. So let's say that anticipating this problem, instead of 
updating the access list to let my car know that you can drive it. Instead, I just give you the ability to impersonate me. I give you my driver's license or my passport or whatever it is that enables you to claim my identity. Well, now not only can you drive the car, you can also sell the car or you can empty my bank account or you can do all sorts of things that you could do if you were me. Well, that going back to Ethereum is like transaction.owner. Transaction.owner avoids the failures of inability to, to delegate because now as one contract calls another, calls another, they all have the same originating transaction owner. But now you have a failure of excess authorization that now there's too many things that the receiver can do because, because the, uh, the authority that's carried is too broad. So the car key is a brilliantly simple device that enables you to do exactly what it enables the holder to do, which is to drive the car. It can even be more narrow, like with the, the, the valet key that doesn't enable you to open the trunk. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's very, very narrow authority, but it can be easily delegated so that you can give some other entity that you're making a request of, you can naturally give it an approximation of least authority. So least authority is sort of the, the fundamental first important security property that any access control system should have, which is the principle that on making a request, the, the entity that the request is made of the, the, uh, should be given approximately the least authority that it needs to carry out that one narrow request. And by giving it least authority, if it goes bad, the amount of authority that it can abuse, if it's malicious or if it has a flaw, enabling it to be subverted by someone, something else that's malicious, the amount of authority that it can abuse is only that least authority that was granted to it. And object capabilities express this in a very natural manner. Got it, got it. That's a great recap. And I always like thinking about this because um, it's, it is, in my opinion, a more elegant way of managing access control. Um, that said, it's not that common. Um, so just to recap, first of all, uh, the idea is that um, with object capabilities, uh, you actually are giving a literal capability uh, as an object to any entity. And so um, that entity can then uh, you know, take specific actions against um, you know, some module or some, some uh, you know, SDK or something like that. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, should that actor turn out to be malicious, we can track that individual uh, entity and make sure that it only had a, a relatively low amount of permissions, while at the same time uh, not using something like access control lists, which would um, lend themselves to abuse, um, as any sort of sysadmin can tell you. Um, so I think this is, this is really um, a, a cool paradigm. And uh, as I recall, you have been working on this for quite some time. Um, to get it into uh, ECMA script um, for uh, for JavaScript, and then you also ended up getting this deep into IBC. Can you sort of tell us uh, about those two processes? Yeah. So the history for me uh, actually starts in um, uh, 1987 uh, when uh, Eric Rexer and I uh, wrote the Agoric Open Systems papers. 87 was when we finished them. Uh, they were published in 88. And uh, those were really, I would say, uh, can really be looked back on as the first substantial smart contracting papers, the first papers that really laid out a vision that had most of what we would today call smart contracting. And I say most of because the full paradigm that we today call smart contracting uh, was not completely formed at that time. Nick Zabo, uh, who, who coined the term, also had some fundamental additional insights. And the... Um, and the full paradigm really comes out of uh, that work as well. But, and Nick and I had a lot of conversations in the 90s and really worked together on this, um, uh, including at my uh, earlier startup company, Agorix, in the mid 90s uh, that Nick, Nick was at uh, briefly. Uh, so we were doing object capability based smart contracts for a long time 
including previous startup companies and previous languages. Uh, Electric Communities was a, a social virtual, graphical social virtual reality uh, that a lot of these, uh, where a lot of these ideas came together uh, very well. And my e-language came out of Electric Communities. Uh, there was an open source effort through the late 90s and early 2000s around uh, my e-language, which is a distributed, persistent, pure object capability programming language, uh, very simple, dynamically typed, had what is in retrospect a very JavaScript-y flavor to it, although I didn't know it at the time because I didn't, I'd never heard of JavaScript when we started it. The, in 2007, I joined uh, Google and Doug Crockford, who had worked with me on E, who had actually named E at Electric Communities, uh, he was at Yahoo, he was involved in the ECMA standardization process of ECMAScript, the standards name for JavaScript. And he convinced me that JavaScript had the essence of a good object capability language in it, as, as, as the phrase goes, struggling to get out. So I joined, at his urging, I joined the ECMAScript committee, in my case, representing Google. And... Uh, he and I and uh, Alan Wurstbrock and uh, uh, Pratap Lakshman, uh, the four of us worked on what, what was at the time called ECMAScript 3.1, which became ECMAScript 5. We did that while the ECMAScript committee was all focused on ECMAScript 4. The consensus of the overall committee, except for uh, us rebels, was on something called ECMAScript 4, which was really this horribly complex language that uh, they had been debating and working on for a long time. Doug Crockford had started this um, splinter group on ECMAScript 3.1, uh, which really consisted mostly of the four of us. Uh, Doug and I wanted to turn JavaScript into a language that could support object capabilities. Uh, ECMAScript 3.1 had those essential enablers. Eventually, ECMAScript 4 failed. ECMAScript 3.1 became ECMAScript 5. Uh, I've been on the committee ever since, guiding JavaScript to support object capabilities uh, ever better. But ECMAScript 5 had the essential enablers. So with the first version of SES, Secure ECMAScript, was a library that we did at Google using the enablers that I got into ECMAScript uh, 5. We published a paper, uh, myself and uh, Bill Tulla and Tom Van Kutzen. Bill Tulla is another one of the founders of Agoric. Um, we published a paper in 2013 called Distributed Electronic Rights in JavaScript, where we really lay out our vision of how, object, how JavaScript with those enablers can be turned not just into an object capability language, but into a distributed secure object capability language capable of supporting decentralized smart contracts. Uh, 2013 was the same year that Ethereum started. We didn't know about Ethereum when we did this. Uh, our paper never mentions blockchain, but everywhere where the, con where the paper says contract host, if you substitute in blockchain, you'll very much get sort of an early um, uh, statement of the architecture that Agoric is currently building. And um, uh, so right now, uh, SES itself is also a standards track. There's a number of other uh, companies that are involved in the ECMAScript standardizations process. Uh, they're pushing it. And most excitingly, uh, SES, Secure ECMAScript, has become the standard the JavaScript standard underneath the ECMAScript um, uh, TC53 process. TC53 is the ECMAScript uh, uh, committee for JavaScript for embedded devices. So JavaScript for embedded devices assumes SES, Secure ECMAScript, as the base JavaScript for writing uh, JavaScript for embedded devices, and the XS JavaScript engine from Modable 
uh, which was built for embedded devices, comes out of the box as an SES engine, and XS is also what we'll be running uh, on blockchain for running our contracts. Cool, cool. Um, a lot to take in there. Um, I think that, number one, it's great that you have the foresight to uh, work on um, object capabilities, getting it into um, into ECMA, uh, you know, like decades sort of before they became relevant for, for blockchain. But um, I'm wondering, uh, and I guess another another comment I have uh, before I ask another question here is that um, it would be pretty useful and apt to the, the uh, example that you gave to actually have um, a secure job, uh, SES actually used for um, IoT devices, right? Because that's almost like, you know, actual physical device, um, like a physical car key or whatever. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm wondering in particular if you can compare the uh, process for getting object capabilities into versions of JavaScript uh, and getting it into IBC, uh, the inter-blockchain communication protocol, uh, where it's also actually, uh, it wasn't originally intended, but has actually been adopted as like a relatively core part of the, the protocol. So IBC, uh, uh, Zaki Manyan, uh, um, one of the founders of the, the Cosmos project and of IBC, uh, he says that uh, IBC itself was very much inspired by the earlier work on the distributed object protocol for my e-language that I had mentioned. Uh, the important thing about the distributed object protocol for the e-language, which was CAPTP on top of VATTP, is that it was assuming mutual mistrust between machines and it provided a security property that I like to summarize as you can reason about all suspicion as if you are suspicious only of objects. So let me take that apart a little bit. This is, by the way, very much in contrast to things like uh, the sharding or the side chains uh, that we're seeing for scalability uh, in the Ethereum world where there's very much a asymmetric trust relationship, there's very much of a hierarchy in a center. Uh, in the case of IBC and the case of the earlier distributed object protocols for the e-language, uh, it was very much mutual suspicion peer to peer. And what it, and the result is that an object running on one machine could not only securely invoke an object on the same machine using the normal local language-based security rules, it could also invoke an object on another machine, even though the other machine was not trusted. So the other machine might be running, might, might be running the object capability language correctly, the other machine itself might be running in a trustworthy manner, but you're just invoking an object that you don't trust. So you depend on the object capability rules to protect you from that object, and that object to protect itself against you. On the other hand, the other machine might not be running the, the language correctly or might not be speaking protocol correctly. And the idea of you can reason about all trust as if you were suspicious only of objects. The idea of that is that if the language is misbehaving, the language implementation is misbehaving, or if the machine is misbehaving, or if it's speaking the protocol incorrectly, that, the to that your total risk to it is no greater than your risk if, it, if its foundations are all running correctly in a trustworthy manner, but the objects you're speaking to are malicious. Uh, and, you're, and you're ignorant of what the particular code is. If the particular code is all malicious code, that the, the damage that it can do is limited to the, to, in the same way. And uh, to, make that, to make clear why that is, just in terms of the object capability concepts we've already talked about, this bearer notion, is the worst case malice of the objects on another machine, if they're misbehaving, is that all of those objects collectively 
are in one joint conspiracy with each other to harm things out to harm things elsewhere to harm me so in that case if i give a capability to any one of the objects on that machine then it might share it with all the other objects that are in that joint conspiracy and then abuse those capabilities those by capability here we mean the object reference the mapping of the car key into objects is that a reference to an object the protected pointer is an unforgeable access, the unforgeable permission to invoke the public interface of that object. So if I get, if I communicate an object reference to some object on this, in this conspiracy, it might share it with any other object in this conspiracy. All those capabilities might jointly be used, might be used to invoke objects, but only those objects that have been given to any of the objects on that machine. Now, if the machine is operating in a malicious manner, then the protocol, the rules of the protocol must enforce the same constraint, which is that giving a capability over the protocol to the machine as a whole enables a malicious machine to abuse the capability that it's been given but does not give it the ability to abuse any capability that it has not been given. So this is actually very much intuitively what you would expect from a peer-to-peer -peer protocol that is about the representation and passing of bearer rights, is that when a bearer right is shared, that the entity it's shared with can now, now has the right and can use it, and any right that has not been given to it, it cannot use. And the result is that, uh, so the IBC protocol very much stands in for the VATTP protocol's role in the old E um, world. There was fundamental new invention that was needed that the Cosmos folk, uh, uh, they, you know, the IBC process with Cosmos folk and Agora collaborating, uh, really did some great new invention needed to do that kind of protocol between blockchains. That was not something that uh, was, was like any problem that had previously been faced before because the hard constraint of blockchains is that a blockchain, the computation running on a blockchain cannot keep a secret. So how do you, how do you create a secure end-to-end -end protocol between logical machines, neither of which can keep a secret. Uh, that was an interesting puzzle to work out. Uh, uh, and with that puzzle worked out, IBC now represents this kind of secure end-to-end -end connection between machines on top of which Agoric has been has reconstructed CAPTP to do the object-to-object -object protocol. I don't know how clear any of that was, but that was that sort of the overall picture, including the history. And I think it was pretty clear. Um, there are two things that come to mind that might be helpful uh, to uh, describe further. One, I would say, is the organizational, political, just conversational differences between uh, getting something into JavaScript versus something in IBC, or really, I think, for, for the audience and me in particular, just how do you get something merged into, say, a Tendermint um, you know, or a Cosmos SDK. And I asked that question um, for a couple of reasons. So for one, um, a lot of the SIF chain protocol intends to work with um, shared security, uh, which is something that's like very deeply, uh, you know, important for the Polkadot ecosystem. And it could be very important for the, the Cosmos ecosystem as well. It kind of exists in Ethereum, uh, just for, for context. Shared security is basically this, this notion that um, one very large uh, blockchain like an Ethereum or like a Polkadot or like a Cosmos hub um, can actually use the uh, tokens uh, that exist in that blockchain to secure the transactions that exist on other blockchains. Um, and so for SIFChain, this is incredibly useful because our PEG architecture ultimately relies on having independent PEG uh, blockchains as opposed to just having them all on the same SIFChain blockchain. And so we could use the SIFChain blockchain to provide crypto-economic security to the PEG zones, or we could use the Cosmos hub, or we could use Binance Chain or any other Cosmos SDK uh, compatible um, 
uh, a chain uh, to provide us crypto economic security. Uh, but uh, as I've been having conversations with uh, you know a few people in the Cosmos ecosystem, there are a couple of different proposals that are floating around for this. Um, it's unclear to me sort of who has deep ownership. I think Informal has a repo with some pretty good progress on it, so I'm happy to see that. Um, but I'm not entirely sure how it relates to some work that Chris goes, another architect in the uh, Cosmos ecosystem has worked on. I think both implementations are a little bit more complex than what we might need. And so um, we have had some you know, um, uh, uh, tepid, but I think strong uh, in interest from people like Sam um, to uh, at, at Interchain to uh, potentially help uh, you know the ICF move forward with this or be an early beta test or something like that, and I think I think the Cosmos SDK uh, and the Cosmos ecosystem is one of the most ideally uh, open source uh, projects in the blockchain ecosystem, and yet uh, it's not anywhere near as far as something like a JavaScript. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could sort of you know discuss like what is it like to get a PR merged in, in one repo versus in, in another. So I want to make clear that the history here uh, with regard to IBC is even though it was uh, inspired uh, by my earlier work, uh, it was largely already reinvented before we became aware of it. Uh, Zucky and the other folks at uh, Cosmos uh, had built and you know invented IBC, had carried the work quite a long ways. And then at Agoric, the early in the early days uh, after the founding of Agoric, facing the same problem, we were starting to reinvent the same thing. And then we came across Cosmos and we came across IBC. And we realized, oh, this is what we need. This is, they, and this is also much, much farther along. And that started our collaboration. So Agoric and the Cosmos folk collaborated together on IBC, the current IBC standard is very much the result of that collaboration. We're now actually uh, talking with some people at ECMA about the possibility of even forming a new uh, uh, ECMA TC, a technical committee uh, to standardize IBC. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen or not, but it looks promising. And, but the IBC has really done a very good job. The IBC group has really done a very good job of proceeding forward, formalizing the protocol, writing it down as a standard. And uh, protocol standards are interestingly different than programming language standards, but the driving issue for both of them is the same, which is interoperability between independent implementations. Yeah, I think that makes that makes a lot of sense. That, that's kind of what I'm, I'm noticing as well. Um, ultimately, you want people to be able to implement uh, in ways that like address their needs um, and also their understanding, right? No one understands the entirety of the software, but to the, as, as, as much as possible, you want them implementing a protocol that's interoperable with other protocols, even if it's not built in the same language, uh, using some parts of the same framework and so forth. Um, and so I can, I can appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think uh, just for, for people in the audience who are wondering, um, this kind of uh, process is relevant, not just for uh, building shared security, which would be a critical feature for the Cosmos network, uh, but also interoperability between uh, Cosmos and Polkadot right now. There's a, a thread I'm in with with a few people from uh, both sides, uh, you know, discussing uh, potential updates that we can make to a Tendermint Light client um, that would actually enable uh, substrate IVC compatibility. And um, so it's it's pretty helpful, I think, to to understand this sort of open source contribution process. I mean, it's, it's also nice to know that IBC is respected enough to be uh, potentially able to, to get a working group uh, uh, built directly with uh, with the ECMA team. So um, again, super happy to hear this. Um, I know when you and I were talking about this earlier, um, and, and just given the fact that you spent so much time working on Agoric, it's pretty safe to say that uh, you feel strongly that Agoric has a spot as a uh, smart contract framework, even in a world which increasingly seems like it's dominated by uh, by Ethereum and Solidity. So can you tell me more about things you feel like Agoric can do uniquely that uh, you know, Solidity might not be uh, equipped to? Yeah, so being better than Solidity is a very low bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, go on. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, the e-language was a, a secure distributed object capability language that we did starting in electric communities, but then through the late 90s and early 2000s, where we had gathered together a 
a substantial open source community around the language, uh, including discussions on the on the list that's also publicly available uh, with uh, Hal Finney and Nick Zabo and uh, other you know, crucial historical figures. Even though E was a general purpose distributed secure programming language, it was always taking smart contracting, decentralized smart contracting as its motivating use case. And what we did during that time is we wrote smart contracts and we took a look at the suitability of the language and the suitability of various patterns for expressing contracts. And we really came to a lot of understanding as to how to build a good language-based framework and patterns for expressing smart contracts well. And what I mean by well is where the contracts themselves are fairly simple, where a programmer writing the contract can have a lot of confidence that the contract means what they think it means. And then, so having done all that, then when Ethereum came out and we started seeing these various bugs happening on Ethereum where hundreds of millions of dollars would disappear overnight uh, with no recourse because of simple bugs in contracts that were constructed by experts that had put a tremendous amount of effort into trying to construct reliable contracts. And nevertheless, simple bugs would cause massive amounts of money to disappear. And we saw the nature of those simple bugs for many of them, not for all of them, but for many of them, the reaction of both myself and many people on the e-community was, ah, if they had only been writing the contracts the way we were writing the contracts in the old E days, they wouldn't have had these problems. And in fact, Brian Warner, one of the founders of Agoric, was on the security review team of Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum had, had contracted with lease authority to do a, a security review. And this was all before the DAO bug happened. And in that security review, Brian and uh, the least authority people identify the vulnerability that turned out to be the DAO bug, identified it before the DAO bug happened, uh, cited the, the work on E and the object capability community as how to avoid those kinds of problems. And if Ethereum had been fixed to take into account the recommendations from that security review, the DAO bug would not have happened. Now, the DAO bug was not itself something fixed by object capabilities per se. It was fixed by uh, asynchrony, avoiding a reentrancy bug. But oh, it comes out of the same overall philosophy and comes out of the work of the object capability community to do that kind of asynchrony to avoid that kind of reentrancy re problem. What in my thesis I refer to as a plan interference problem. So I'm sorry, I think I lost the, um, uh, well, I think I lost the thread of what the original question was, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, my question is basically, what can you do in Agoric that you can't do in Solidity? Uh, it sounds like obviously there, there were a number of uh, security issues in Solidity beyond that. Um, it's just not a particularly performant language. So um, I think a lot of the security problems that you, you mentioned between the DAO bug and then other things that are, uh, you know, for people who are unaware, like the, the general paradigm for developing, um, you know, smart contracts in Solidity is actually that you don't build from scratch. You use a relatively standardized template uh, from a group like Open Zeppelin. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, you use relatively standard like deployment uh, and processing scripts and things like a Truffle. And the, that ecosystem is starting to mature a bit, like Hard Hat is kind of replacing Truffle. And um, they, a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, DeFi protocols are becoming a little bit more standardized in implementation. And a lot of the issues are composability related and we're seeing a lot more understanding of like, how to deal with composability in Ethereum. So I do see progress happening in Solidity, uh, but as, you know, a, um, as, as a, a blockchain enthusiast who's interested in figuring out what is the smart contracting language to invest in, um, you know, what is the, the claim for Agoric versus Solidity in your mind? Okay, so there's, first of all, the, the fundamental 
problems with Solidity that we've already gone through. The, the vulnerability to uh, re-entrancy and then the identity-based access control creating both problems of insufficient expressiveness, like not being able to let the valet drive the car, or problems of excess authority, like enabling you to sell my car. Um, so that creates uh, a pervasive, weak, weak starting point for writing things that are that you can be confident or secure, and writing things that crucially, when they go bad, have limited risk. So uh, I want to introduce sort of the other element of starting with bearer rights uh, and narrow authority, which is partitioning of risk. Uh, and then after that, I want to get, make sure to get to composition, because composition in Ethereum is a tremendously shallow form of composition compared to the composition that we're familiar with from good programming language work and the composition that Agoric brings to contracting with our framework. So the partitioning of risk says that after you've done the work of least authority, where you give each thing only the authority that it needs, you'll still find that sub -co some components in any particular architecture, some components still need a lot of authority to do their job. And if you give them a lot of authority and they go bad, then you have a lot of risk. But whether you've got authority hotspots like that depends on the architecture. So one of the things that you want to do in constructing a good secure architecture is to figure out how to refactor authority hotspots so there's not so much risk altogether in one place. Let me give you the beautiful example of uh, Zoe. Zoe is uh, the Agoric smart contract framework uh, architected by uh, Kate Sills at Agoric. Um, and it's an answer to the following standard way that everybody else does smart contracts. And in fact, every, all the ways that we had done smart contracts before the founding of the modern Agoric. So all of my historical work had the same conundrum as I'm about to explain, which is a smart contract is something that manages rights of the participants. All of the rights at stake in the contract are put in escrow with the contract at the beginning. The contract holds those rights. And then the uh, dis redistribution of, of rights derived from those rights back to the participants only happens according to the logic of the contract. So that's sort of a universal statement over all smart contracts. But the way everyone had done this, including us historically, is to give those rights to the contract and then depend on the contract operating correctly in managing those rights. And what that means is that if the contract goes bad, all of the rights and trust to, the, to that contract can be, um, uh, are those, all of those rights are at risk. At Agoric, we rethought that around the question, well, what if you just don't give the rights itself directly to the contract? We came up with a abstraction we call the offer, which is, sort of the basic quid pro quo notion that's really at the heart of any notion of real world contracting, which is that when a participant in a contract puts rights at stake in the contract, they do it in the context of an offer saying, here's what I'm willing, here's what I'm proposing to give, but in exchange, here is what I want. And they make the offer to the Zoe mechanism, which is a fixed amount of code, which is sort of the smart contracting kernel that stands between the participants and the contracts. They, the Zoe mechanism 
escrows those rights, but does it in the context of the offer that describes what the participant wants in exchange for those rights. And the Zoe mechanism guarantees that for, a, for each participant, either they will get what they said they wanted, or they will get a full refund of all of the rights that were put into escrow. And uh, to put it out another way, each participant knows that the rights they've put into escrow are rights that they will only lose if they get what they said they want in exchange. Otherwise, they'll get the rights back. And so let me give it. That doesn't mean that uh, the, the risk to misbehavior of the contract has gone away. But what it means is that we've limited that risk. We've, we've implemented a safety property such that there's a whole class of bugs that are now off the table. And then their residual risk is something that's much more bounded. Let me give an example. Let's say that the contract is an auction. In a normal auction, let's say it's a second price auction. Uh, in, a normal, in a normal auction, when a bidder places a bid, even in a second price auction, as they place their bid, they were put into escrow the first price, the full amount of their bid. And then having made all the bids, a properly functioning auction will award the good being auctioned to whoever bid the most. And in a second price auction, will charge them the price of the second highest bid. In a misbehaving auction, in the way everybody was doing smart contracts before Zoe, in a misbehaving auction, the auctioneer can just run off with all of the money and run off with the good being auctioned. Um, in a misbehaving auction running on Zoe, the misbehaving auction might award the good to someone other than the highest bidder, might charge them the first price rather than the second price, might give to the seller, the one auctioning the good, might give them no more than their reserve price. They express their reserve price with what they want in exchange for the good because that's the want that gets enforced. So there's still a lot of significant risk to a misbehaving auctioneer. Auditing the, the auction contract to get confidence that, it's, that it means what you want what you, what you think it means is still an important issue. But everyone that did not get the good is guaranteed to get a full refund. And the entity that did get the good is guaranteed that they're not going to pay more than the first price, more than the price that they bid. Um, so there's the total r residual risk to misbehavior by the auctioneer is tremendously bounded. So that's the philosophy that once you've got this bearer-based least authority architecture, your job isn't done because there are still hot spots where there's a tremendous amount of concentrated risk, but you've gotten, you now have the software design problem that you can now address, which we have addressed, of how to refactor things, how to rethink the problem, so, so as to break up those hot spots, so there's not so much concentrated risk in any one place. Now, on the um, composability, the kind of composability that you see in Ethereum is very shallow. It's that you can, let's say, during a overall transaction, uh, you can take money that flowed out of this thing and feed it into that thing, take money that flowed out of that thing, feed it into the other thing. So this is like where flash loans, you can kind of create this um, set of transactions that together compose, that compose together to pay back the loan during the flash, uh, during the transaction and bring about some other overall transfer. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's very much a, a first order kind of composition. It's like uh, applying, uh, in programming language terms, it's like applying a function to data, uh, producing new data, taking the data that comes out of the first function, feeding it into a second function, which produces data that you feed into another function. In programming language terms, 
the much more powerful kind of composition that we know is higher order composition, where functions can not only operate on data, uh, functions can operate, the kinds of things that functions can operate on, let's call them values, itself includes functions. And then a parametric function can operate on, on, on any value, whether the value is, a da is data or a function. The reason we call this higher order is in um, mathematics, a function that operates, let's say, on numbers would be a first order function. And then a function that operates on first order functions would be a second order function. So you, you in one way of doing foundational mathematics, you've got a hierarchy of orders. Uh, then in a programming language, when we have higher order functional programming, functions can operate on other functions without having to be stratified into different orders. So we call that generically higher order functional programming. Objects likewise can operate on values or other objects. So the kind of thing that an object can operate on is also the kind of thing that an object is. And it's that kind of compositionality that creates the richness that we experience with higher order functional programming and with object oriented programming languages. Now, there's yet another form of higher order composition that, that, um, that arises at a new level of abstraction where we're dealing with property rights. And this is actually a way to, to view what is so powerful in the way real world economies work. What part of what makes the, for the rich compositionality of real world markets and what's needed to recapitulate, in, which needed to, to um, in order for the smart contracting worlds that we're building to be able to express the kind of richness that we've got in the composition of contracts in real world markets. So having created the abstract notion of property which is the kind of thing of, of a right, of a transferable right, which is the kind of thing the contracts operate on, any contract that unfolds over time, the ability to participate in that contract is itself valuable. And what real world contracts do is having created the abstract concept of a property right, which is something the contracts can operate on, they then are able to take the, the valuable position of participating in a contract, label that a property right, and then enable that right in turn to be tradable in other contracts. So to take a, just the, the starting, um, example, sort of the canonical example we keep revisiting, which is uh, the covered call option is the, uh, is you, you create, if you, let's say, write me a call option, uh, then um, let's say that, that you own a concert ticket and you find out that you're not going to go to the concert. So you'd like to uh, sell the concert ticket to someone else who might be able to go to the concert that day. And I think I might be able to, but I'm not sure. So I say, um, here's $5 uh, uh, if you'll hold on to the right for me to buy the, so I'd like to reserve through the weekend the right for me to buy the concert ticket from you. So you say, okay, for $5, you've, I, you'll reserve for me the right to buy the concert ticket uh, and then at, at the end of the weekend, I might decide whether to buy the concert ticket or not. Well, during the weekend, I'm now in a valuable position. Uh, taking the covered call option and being able to sell that position in the contract to somebody else so that they, so that they can now take my reservation and use it to buy the concert ticket from you, that would be the position in the contract being treated as a transferable right. And this sounds kind of abstract, but we see this kind of thing all of the time in actual markets. This is a form of higher order composition because now the kinds of rights that contracts manipulate 
are now also the kinds of rights that they create. Or to put it another way, uh, the derivative rights, um, rights as derivative instruments, are now just property rights that any generic rights manipulating contract can now manipulate. So Zoe also facilitates this by creating a concept of an invitation. When you create a contract, the way you invite other entities to participate in the contract is you create these invitations. The invitation itself is a transferable property right that can be manipulated as a right put into escrow, described in terms of wants, all of those enablers in terms of Zoe so that the kinds of rights that a Zoe contract can manipulate is also the kinds of rights that a Zoe contract creates. And this creates a much richer form of higher composition. Um, uh, and in fact, we've been exploring a lot of this. We've had, um, uh, we're now in beta, we've had hackathons, we've had other people come in, write contracts for our systems. And we've uh, really corroborated, we've really confirmed with this experience that we're able to teach other people how to write contracts in this way. They're able to come up to speed quickly. They're able to write con contracts in a fairly confident manner. Uh, they're able to explain those contracts and they're able to do it in a programming language that's already familiar to 20 million programmers. And I think most interestingly, it's not just that the language is familiar, it's that the way of thinking about security, the object capability approach to security is actually an extension of the familiar thinking that object-oriented programmers already have about how they manage modularity and abstraction, not for security purposes. That the thing that all object programmers know is that an object reference is the ability to invoke the public interface of an object and when an object reference is passed as an argument and a message, that that enables the receiving argument, object, the receiving object, that argument enables the receiving object to invoke the argument object. And that all of our practices of modularity, of trying to keep systems loosely coupled as to not have a lot of unnecessary connectivity, a lot of unnecessary access uh, in good object-oriented programmers. We leverage those intuitions uh, in the way we think about security so that it becomes a much shallower learning curve, starting from familiar languages with the distributed programming being an extension of their intuitions about how they do local programming, where you're just sending messages to remote objects the way you send messages to local objects, except asynchronously. Um, uh, the extension of the object programming intuitions you've already got into the security realm, and the bringing of higher order composition, which if all you knew was first order composition would seem very fancy, but coming from modern programming practice, it's the natural form of composition you're drawn to, and it brings you much closer to the, to the patterns of market composition that we're used to from real world markets. I really appreciate that. Um, I learned something new because I don't think we've discussed higher order compositions before. And that is a very strong draw. For me, the, the draw for Agoric has always been um, the compatibility with uh, JavaScript, which is something very a lot of people are familiar with, and the improved security benefits. But I think that um, those two benefits to me seemed uh, dubious in the face of this uh, huge onslaught of uh, you know people trying to build whatever they can in Solidity just because Ethereum has such had such strong market performance. Uh, but this new argument that we can use higher order comp higher order compositions in, with Agoric actually um, it makes me feel like between that and the other two benefits I mentioned, we could see a scenario in which a lot of new, relatively less experienced in financial contract development. Um, engineers start creating a bunch of uh, contracts that are used for their own local purposes, uh, but there's a lot more safety because it's more secure. And also the higher order compositions make it so that their little small economies can actually be relevant for larger economies. 
Um, so I've often thought about things like, you know, a betting market on like, you know, is my friend going to show up to work on time? Or, you know, will my, my kids little league uh, soccer game get rained on? And it's like, do I read anyone really care? Does anyone really want to put big money on that? But you could actually have a really good market for this if you had higher order compositions. Uh, plus, there's the, the a concern that we see with things like um, uh, cascading interest rates, right? So um, the the uh, really awesome interest rates that are available to some large institutions, like financial institutions, are just not available for the everyday consumer. Um, and there's a, a function, there, there's a kind of high order composition in the market, but it takes a very long time and requires like actual wet ink paper in many of these cases, because these guys, to some extent, use technology and to some extent don't. Um, it requires a lot of very slow moving uh, institutions to like bring that composability. Whereas if all of this stuff could be done um, algorithmically and any one of the uh, privileged actors can just defect and say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to deal with uh, any sort of classism and um, you know rent seeking. I'm just going to sell these these rights to the highest bidder. Uh, you can very much uh, more easily see a situation in which central banks or other uh, major um, uh, governing uh, economic or financial regulators um, could actually influence uh, retail uh, spending behavior more uh, more directly. So this is really cool. Um, and I'm I'm guessing this is stuff you've thought about. I see the big grin on your face. Uh, so it's it's been a long time coming for you. Yeah. Uh, so the, the let me start with the the uh, the issue you started with, which is uh, simply the Ethereum being the attractor, being the first mover, being the place where there's so much of the volume of contracting. How do you overcome the inertia of the first mover advantage of uh, Ethereum being such a, a deep locus of of contracts? And a lot of what 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 the lock-in is there, well, the lock-in power is simply the volume of the, 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 the total amount of assets that are trading on Ethereum, and the value of those assets. And this is where the pegging relationships that IBC directly supports, that Cosmos is supporting with Peggy, and that uh, Goric is supporting with Pegasus, uh, all come in, which is enabling rights that exist on one chain to effectively be traded on other chains and removing the friction so that in order to trade in rights that are on a particular chain, there's no particular advantage in the contracts that are trading about those rights being on the same chain. If you can remove the friction, remove the advantage of being on the same chain, or to put it another way, re remove the comparative costs of not being on the same chain, of being on another chain, then the contracts that are trading about those rights can simply be on whatever chain is the best chain for running the contracts. And we're building a much better chain for, for expressing and running contracts. And the, the we're familiar from the web, for example, that links between websites are very, very low friction compared to links within a website. If I want to write a document that links to a particular set of other documents, there's no particular need for me to host that document on the same web server as those other documents, because the fact that those other documents on a particular web server does not form some strong attractor that keeps me from writing a document that runs elsewhere that, um, that, that makes links to those documents. If we can remove the friction from trading about the assets at a distance in the same manner, which we believe we're doing, then the place to run the contract simply becomes the best place to write and run contracts. Uh, so I don't think that the first mover advantage of Ethereum uh, regarding the locus of assets is going to be sticky regarding the running of contracts. Um, now, um, I'm sorry, once again, I'm sorry, I, I got, uh, what was the rest of your question? Uh, it, well, it was just a more of a, a comment um, where I said that, uh, you know, I've been concerned that the entire sort of programming um, you know, class of, of 2021 
uh, for smart contracts is going to be heavily focused on solidity. And uh, even if Agoric is better, then there's not necessarily a room to, reason to switch. Although at the same time, um, I think once people really grok this idea of higher order, compos higher order composability, they may end up realizing that there's more value potentially to be generated through Agoric style contracts. Right, right. And the the other thing that you had been saying was the uh, thing about the um, inaccessibility to regular people of a lot of these fancy contractual arrangements as they, ha they happen in the economy right now and compared to how the kinds of contracts that Agoric enables uh, with the higher recomposition uh, really brings down the, you know, and it opens up the benefits of contracting in a very casual way to lots and lots of regular activities, activities that aren't not necessarily thought of as financial but just cooperative arrangements between people it makes those much more part of the normal fabric of life that we can support without having to turn to intermediary institutions, without having to turn to jurisdictional legal systems, without having to turn to laws and courts, that um, we're really able to create a richness of cooperative frameworks that people can use for uh, interacting with each other in a trustworthy manner. Um, just yeah. using these kinds of, of um, the kinds of code that, that, that millions of regular programmers can put together. Yeah, so I, I expect there's a lot more value to be gleaned um, from Agoric than even I realized prior to joining the call, which I think pretty much happens every time we talk. Um, let me take a quick look here. It looks like there's a question around, um, you know, connecting to uh, learning about Agoric. I, I would say, um, you know, I, there, there's a pretty good amount of, of content on the website. Um, so you, you can kind of just check out the Agoric website if you want more detail, like how to get started. But there's, a, the, like, as, as a two-parter question, it's just uh, what do, what kinds of smart contracts would you particularly be interested in seeing um, to, uh, you know, it, from the Agoric ecosystem? a good question. Um, take a look at our hackathons. Uh, when we do the hackathons, we, uh, we put out some challenges and uh, we also ask people to invent new contracts and people have come up with some very creative stuff and uh, uh, take a look at in particular at the, uh, a lot of the prize winners from our earlier hackathons. Uh, we're creating a you know, the, the wonderful thing about creating platforms like this is when people surprise you, when they create something that you take a look at and say, um, oh, I never would have thought of that, but that's exactly the kind of thing that we were building this platform in order to enable. And I'm so glad somebody realized that. Um, so, uh, So the, the, the main thing that we're, that a lot of activity is happening on right now, the kind of the big killer app, if you will, for smart contracting that we're seeing in the world, including on Agoric, is DeFi. So certainly there's a lot of exploration of the DeFi space. Uh, but I also want to make sure not to lose sight of um, that we didn't create this just for DeFi, just for kinds of cooperative arrangements that one might think of as financial. We created this as a medium to enable people to cooperate better in general, cooperate with strangers, uh, cooperate uh, in rich manners without having to trust intermediaries, without having to rely on legal institutions. Um, uh, and there's a tremendous richness of ways people cooperate that are outside of um, finance. Now, there's also tremendous ways to mix concepts of finance and non-finance that where the, you know, the category difference between finance and non-finance might be a mental barrier preventing people from seeing ways from mixing the concepts. 
So I, I would encourage a lot of creativity in that regard. Uh, governance, I think, is probably one of the most important things for people to experiment with. Uh, innovations in governance, things like invention of democracy, the inventions of representative government, separation of powers, all of these things have been tremendous advances in the ability of human society to operate better. Uh, uh, concepts of rule of law that, that are tremendously have been, been tremendous assets, even though jurisdictional governments have been so bad at it. They've been good enough to give us a taste of the advantages. Uh, we can get a much, much better approximation of rule of law, uh, rule of law-like systems uh, built on code. And futarchy is a great example of the kind of governance experiment that I'm e eager to see people try. Uh, things like uh, Alex Tabarrok's uh, dominant assurance contracts for overcoming various kinds of free rider problem, uh, other kinds of collective action problems. Uh, the thing to remember about these kinds of governance things is that most governance experiments will go wrong. Most governance experiments, like most mutations in biology, just won't work out. But a few, but you know, in biology, although most mutations are fatal, all progress depends on the few mutations that are not fatal. Uh, the governance experiments that do work out, some of them will work out brilliantly, and a few really brilliant innovations in governance can make our civilization a vastly more pleasant place for all of us. Yeah, um, a few things have come to mind, actually. I just took some notes to, to comment on. Um, to, um, I, I want to go to what you just said, but to kind of catch up on a, a larger chain of thought that I've seen throughout the conversation. Um, number one, this idea of using Zoe to uh, make it so that rather than having centralized uh, access control in a single smart contract, you actually um, basically give the smart contract certain rights uh, temporarily, but based on meeting certain qualifications. Um, I've seen something like this in sort of futuristic-ish um, blockchain design. So, you know, for example, I've seen peg architecture in which rather than having the peg control all of the assets, there are like shards of pegs controlling different sets of assets. Uh, mm -hmm. 4chan also uses this actually, uh, where, you know, it's vaults are actually distributed, they're actually like multiple vaults. And so if one of them is hacked or crashed for whatever reason, um, it has a relatively limited amount of funds that you can release. And I do think that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a, another sort of um, uh, kind of a thing that I wanted to mention, which is that I believe uh, when we were talking about this whole first mover advantage, um, potentially for Ethereum um, not being not being a uh, a, a game ender, um, I, I'm actually you know looking at the charts and and always notice uh, Binance um, Binance Chain creeping up really heavily um, in in the, um, in the in the in the coin market cap rankings, um, where there's a uh, you know for for the most part, if you look at the top say ten coins. You've got Bitcoin, which is actually where most of the assets are concentrated. You've got Ethereum, which is has the first mover advantage for bringing any kind a smart contract um, ecosystem of any kind into the uh, the world. And then you've got, or at least uh, into the crypto markets in a way that's like uh, very heavily traded. And then you've got a huge set of experiments, uh, you know, below. Um, and Binance Chain has really kind of laid claim to uh, being. Uh, like the solid like number three and just in terms of of liquid market cap so there's this uh this this idea that like a more centralized i wouldn't say entirely centralized but more centralized institution can be very savvy with its assets and use them to generate a, a substantial amount of value um, i don't know to what extent they'll be able to get close to ethereum we'll have to see um but that's very different from ethereum which at least posits itself as more of a um a, a distributed sort of public good um, where there, there isn't really a central actor kind of managing the assets on the chain. Um, so I'm interested to see how that plays out. If if Binance Smart Chain, uh, I think I think pretty much, I, I would actually say it's, it's almost proven at this point that uh, you know, a, a relatively savvy financial actor uh, that's, that's somewhat centralized in coordination, like Binance can uh, accumulate, you know, tens of billions of values for its chain which means that a, a Chase or a City or a Goldman Sachs, I don't know if if they were able to uh, you know update their DNA accordingly, 
could build a similar ecosystem. Um, so there's that is a comment that I, I've noted. And then the third bit around the governance thing, um, I, I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but maybe you can, you can opine. Um, you realize that you're, you're basically saying you could just sell your vote in governance, right? Like I could, um, you know, I have this, this, this decision I can make uh, and I've got one vote for, for a particular outcome. Uh, if I very, if I care a lot about it, then great, I can vote. Uh, if not, then I just sell the rights to that vote, um, which may be a market clearing uh, outcome, um, although it does run counter to some of our, our intuitions around democracy. So those are just takeaways that, that I had from what you said. Yeah, I think the 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 counterintuitiveness of that uh, is a good you know is a red flag that we should take seriously. Uh, it might be that for the kinds of things we think of as democratic like, that adopting voting structures where you can sell your vote might in fact be pathological, and we need some other way to to approach the benefits that we associate with democracy or not. Uh, I, this is, um, once again, an area where it's very, very hard to think through things from first principles. Uh, the, one of the wonderful things about the whole blockchain space uh, is that we can now experiment where a governance experiment that goes wrong doesn't, you know, in the 20th century, governance experiments that went wrong killed millions of people. Uh, we can now uh, do governance experiments and have them go wrong with much, much less risk, uh, you know, and um, and the issue about the selling the vote, an example where we've got real world experience with something like voting, uh, one would one would not so much say like democracy, but where selling the votes are not pathological, is stockholders. Uh, voting their stock. Uh, the idea that a stockholder voting their stock, when they sell their stock, they sell their voting rights, or they could even sell their, you know, proxy their voting rights without selling their stock. None of that seems pathological in the context of uh, stock equity leading to uh, decisions by shareholders. And when that is a good metaphor for something that should apply to the to to other problems in the world and when it shouldn't is open uh is something to be explored another example where selling the vote does not seem pathological is futarchy uh, in futarchy uh, what you're doing is betting on outcomes is trying to uh is you're, you're betting on predictions of things and selling the vote in that case is simply selling the ability to place a prediction effectively. Uh, it's not really a good way to, to characterize it, but the buying and selling of, of prediction power there and simply not making a prediction, allowing the predictions of others to carry the weight of the prediction uh, is also something that would not be seen in that context as leading to a pathology. So, um, so I think I think all of this. I don't have, you know, overall. Like I said, governance is something that it's very hard to think through from first principles what will and will not work. And it's great that we have a medium now in which we can afford to do large-scale experiments with governance. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And yes, we will see some pretty interesting things come out. Um, my last comment, and then I'll, I'll just turn it over to you and wrap, is that um, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Balaji uh, Srinivasan's, um, you know, comments around the, the next type of states being network states, right? This notion that, uh, you know, we will have these democratic uh, or, or democratic like institutions that will exist on cryptocurrency networks, um, but they'll be primarily focused around the network rather than the nation or the city. And I think that a an expectation would be that you're invested in an asset that you're expecting to go up, and thus the entire engagement is much more financial in nature. Um, and so um, deviations from uh, you know the the things that are considered priceless like identity or um, 
uh, values or what have you, like those things can trade more directly on an open market. And then you can just sort of see uh, what collectively will happen as a result of people engaging uh, in a free market by, by um, uh, selling votes or buying votes or whatever. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm very interested to see someone actually try Futarki, but my intuition is that we have a lot more uh, base layer infrastructure around uh, making betting markets before that's uh, super practical. And also I think that there have to be uh, different, say, derivatives of uh, base level layer Futarki in order for them to work, but I, I still think it's cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I think this has been pretty helpful. Uh, we've kind of got, I guess, both of us to get back to work to actually make sure that the infrastructure that we need to even try these experiments is going to work. Um, but I, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. This was a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, cool. And and let me also just make one more point about the, the point you make about Futarchy. I also have a similar uh, skepticism about it. Uh, and one of the things that really occurs to me is that when we imagine Futarchies that work, what the implicit assumption behind that is a very thick market that there's a lot of money and a lot of players and a lot of hypotheses, hypotheses, um, uh, and the pro and a lot of our thinking in general about trying to reconstruct on crypto, a lot of what we see in the real world markets. When we think through it from first principles, our first temptation is to think through. Well, assuming a thick market, assuming that we already have a large volume of players and that we've got the price discovery that happens as a result of a large amount of trade, so we have discovered prices and all these things. Uh, and the problem is that if you create something that works once you have a thick market, when you first deploy it, you don't yet have a thick market. And if it doesn't work when you first deploy it, it doesn't grow to have a thick market. So that there's this bootstrapping problem of how do you survive the initial thin market in order to grow into the thick market that enables the institution to work like it's supposed to. And one of the things that's very exciting about the whole crypto blockchain space is this inpouring of billions of dollars of capital that I think has taken everybody by surprise at how quickly it can happen is able to get us to thick markets in a much faster manner than I think we had expected. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think there's a there's a there's a science to or in a pre, there's there's, there's a much more much more of an appreciation that I have for the science and engineering and art of market making, both literally and figuratively. And I think um, we started with. You know, the tokens themselves, and then we kind of moved to DeFi. And now there's NFTs, there's social network tokens, and or social tokens, I should say. And um, I, I think there's some kind of um, uh, there, there's a lot to the notion of like building out the market so you can get the retail, you can get the whales, you can get different kinds of whales, um, and then you can ultimately get people making uh, taking complex, nuanced positions that reveal their perspective about the market, which helps the market become more overall informed. And I think that will lead us to having a, uh, a more overall informed society. All right. Wow. We, uh, we, we definitely did a good job on this one. I think, uh, we will, uh, post the transcript and the recording online. Uh, Mark, thanks a lot for, for joining. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. This was a tremendous amount of fun. Perfect. All right. Take care.